Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Hey guys, welcome back to the Happier and Healthier podcast. Today I am with Elena Kanan, who is the founder of Greenheart Organic Farms. The reason that this farm is so special is not only because it's organic, but because it's in the middle of a desert. So she's going to be sharing a lot about organic produce today, um, farming, why we want to choose organic and sustainable methods. So Elena, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. So we just had an amazing walk around your farm. Yes. I'm curious, how did you get into farming? You weren't always a farmer. No, but I come from a family where we grew parts of our food in our sort of home garden farm type setup. My my great aunt was big into that and some other relatives. So I was familiar with the concept of growing your own food, which a lot of people are not. But when I came to the Middle East first to Dubai is 25 years ago. And the, there weren't as many choices as there are today. And um, to get really good food was difficult. Fresh, greens, organic, it just wasn't available. So out of, I had some health issues and I needed good food. And um, I was bringing some stuff in, but the greens basically were, were lacking from my diet. And so I started very small on the balcony and then we had a garden and then I went to farms that belonged to friends of mine you know I had a lot of local friends and so it kind of slowly but surely grew and we experimented and um, when I had my kids it kind of became such a passion and I was so grateful that I was able to feed them really healthy clean food uh, that and then more mums asked me oh can you grow some for me and and then the desire really kicked in that I, I want to do this for a living. I want to provide people with the best possible produce. I want to feed people basically with, with honest food. And when I started, I wasn't really sure how far I could take it. So it was, we took it like every, every month it was a new surprise, a new little achievement. And it gets you hooked. And the more you achieve, the more you want to achieve. And it started like that. And it's a journey with every day we do something new, we discover. And um, it's, yeah, it's every day you learn something new. It's incredible. I, the farm is huge. I'm just so amazed by what you've created. How many varieties of produce are you growing here? It's around 140 now. Wow. And it's, I mean, we, we grow alone uh, 30 different types of tomatoes. So if you look at it from that angle, then we have, this year we've really pushed the boat out with the cucumbers. Mm -hmm. So I really want to move away from growing hybrid cucumbers. So we have, I think it's now 12 that were selected for second growing because we had initially a lot of different varieties and then we select again. So we had select 12 and out of those 12, we're probably going to carry on with eight. So we always grow more initially and then kind of make the selection. See what works. Yeah, see here. what works, what, what people want as well. You know, if something is not popular at all, there's no point growing it, you know. Right. So, but um, sometimes we persist with things as well where we see it will take a bit longer and has a future. It just needs a few attempts. Our lemon cucumber, for instance, the classic example, when I first grew it six years ago, nobody was interested. It just people weren't having it. Now, the moment we have it, it's on the website, people are ordering it straight away. So it is a real success story, but it took a little bit longer, you know? Yeah. Can you explain what's the difference between a hybrid variety mm -hmm. and an heirloom variety? So heirloom variety is everything that's been around before 1952. 1952 was the year where mass-produced industrial seeds first came along. Now, not all mass-produced industrial seeds are hybrids, but most of them are. And they'd be more expensive to buy for the hobby gardener because they say they're the better variety because they grow faster, they give you better yields, la de la They're more resilient to pests and disease and certain things. But the main characteristic of hybrids is that you cannot grow them back true to seed. So let's say you grow a hybrid tomato and you want to take the seed and you replant the seed. You won't get the variety. See what I mean? So you won't be able to do that because it's sterile. And some of them you will get little plants maybe, but there won't be any fruit. So it's really important for us in the desert setting that we choose varieties 
that um, are heirloom, so we can adjust the seeds to the growing conditions. So every year they do better. They need less water. They're better adjusted. And, um, and it really makes sense because we have a very limited amount of resources. So there's no point here growing Dutch uh, lettuce, for instance, here, hybrid lettuce, because they need an awful lot of water. And many of them are designed for, for hy um, hybrid m growing methods. So, for instance, for hydroponic or aquaponic or these kind of varieties, types of growing, which is not suitable for us at all. We want the growing soil. We believe in soil. And um, for us, we need traditional varieties that are doing really well in hot climates. Yeah. So where we select the countries that we select from are hot weather countries. So there's no point going to the north of, you know, Scotland <laughs> to select vegetable varieties that they grow there. You know, there's no point. Right. Mm. Sometimes when you go to the grocery store, yeah. you get these tomatoes that are this big yeah. and you buy them and you cut into them and it's all water. There's absolutely no flavor. Yeah. So a lot of these modern varieties yeah. are grown to be heavier because yeah. you pay by the pound. Yeah. And then, there, but there's no flavor left. No flavor, yeah. And the, the, the problem is, you see, you can't have it both ways. You can't have flavorsome, uh, nutritious produce and get it very quickly. So modern varieties have been bred to produce a lot of vegetables very quickly. They have shallow roots, they grow very quick, they take chemical fertilizers that are added topically. So in, in the shortest period of time, you have huge fruit that are full of water. They take up a lot of water as well, so you need for, for this setting, it would not be suitable at all. And that's why there is no flavor and the chemicals take away any taste, any sweetness, and um, the pesticides are really negative, not just in terms of that they're adding toxins, but they're also hindering the development of flavor and, and size and so forth. So they're designed to create, uh, for instance, the tomatoes that are suitable for export. They have a thick skin. They, to um, withstand all the yeah, jostling yeah, yeah. of travel. They have thick skin. They're harvested when they're green. And then they're sprayed with ethylene. You know? So this is why we, we eat fruit that has no flavor, has no nutrients, and it's actually really toxic. But the way that these hybrids, this is what the hybrids are designed to do. Mm -hmm. And flavor and nutritional value have been sacrificed for speed and volume in a nutshell. Right. So this is, this is what's happened, unfortunately. And this is why we eat so unhealthy. Even if we go to the supermarket, we buy a lot of vegetables and we think we do ourselves a favor. We eat raw food, but the raw food that we eat is a fake, you know, mm -hmm. because there's really not much nutrient in, because nutrients in food have to come from somewhere and they have to come from healthy soil. And when you don't have healthy soil, there is no nutrients in the plant. And because the chemical uh, fertilizers, they will not give nutrients to the actual fruit when we talk about tomatoes here. So they will make the plant grow fast and they will make the fruit develop, but there is no nutrient in it as itself. So nutrient uptake has to happen very slowly gradually so when we add compost to the soil the roots have to evolve they have to uptake the nutrients of the soil slowly and it happens there's a lot of different uh, things stages that are happening here but it's when you give chemical fertilizers it's like it's like a shot in one go and it pushes it up and there's a growth spurt mm -hmm. but when you grow with um, natural compost and, and, and natural minerals it's a very slow process and that's where you get the flavor, the nutritional value. That's when you get the nice texture, you know. So it's a really, and that's when you get the smell, even the smell. Modern varieties, there's no smell. You can stand next to a tomato and you wouldn't know it was a tomato. Right. Whereas here, if you go and smell on those tomatoes. Just walking by, so it's amazing, so beautiful. You know? Because it grows way too fast to develop a smell. Yeah. See? And all of the phytochemicals. Exactly. Underneath. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So with the soil, you started here with essentially sand, yeah, right? And you had to create the soil over years and years yeah, by using co compost. Yes, yeah, so we, we made our compost. We very quickly realized that we needed to make our own soil, that anything that we were trying from the outside, it was just wasn't working mm -hmm. um, larger scale. So we, we have the animals, so we have very few animals to begin with. We have a lot more now. We have the goats, we have chickens, we've got cows. And we feed them from fodder grown at the farm. 
and then we are slaughter free farm so nobody has to be scared that we are killing our animals it's a slaughter free farm and we, we don't even sell milk for instance we, we sell a few of the eggs but it's we mainly have the animals just for the manure and the manure has to be very good quality so that we have to have really happy animals that are fed properly and the manure is then mixed in with the plant crop leftovers that is dried shredded and the composting process takes about six months and um, once the manure is fully decomposed and healthy um, then we need to mix it in with the soil that is already in the in the land so it, we have a ratio of about 15 to 20 percent every growth cycle so you saw the big compost heap earlier that yeah. was ready to go really nice black strong soil full yeah. of nutrients and then that goes in and you can see the outside field that we just created you saw how nice the soil looked right yeah and that was then a field that was ready to go yeah you know one thing that's been really interesting being here is seeing how everything's interrelated you mix yeah. the the vegetables together mm -hmm. for example here we're sitting by some kale and there's also some scallions or spring onions planted mm -hmm. in the middle and why do you do that so we believe huge believer in companion planting so first of all, you see everything is mixed up. We don't do monoculture. So most farms would take this entire field and grow one variety. Now, we have similar varieties here because kale is a little bit more tricky and lettuce is a little bit more tricky to grow. So we need to keep a certain temperature level in here. But we are interplanting different varieties. And um, then we have companion plants to keep pests at bay. So kale is very nutritious, white flies absolutely love it. And to keep them away, we interplant with garlic, onions, marigolds, you know, different types of herbs, and it really, really works. So the scent essentially acts it's as a natural pesticide to keep the little bugs and critters away. Well, not entirely, uh -huh. but it's not necessary. We can have all sorts of different living creatures here, but it, they mustn't take overhand. Right. That's the key. You don't want them eating through all of your kale. Exactly. That's what we want to avoid. Yeah. And that's what happens. And monoculture is really, um, a, a, really a modern day evil. And we need to move away from it. We need to create smaller farms on which families live and in which families work on and where they grow loads of different crops and they have animals, livestock that they keep for compost production. This is the way forward. And people say this is old fashioned. We need to find more technical and more technical approach. But really, this is this is what people say that don't really understand farming, to be honest. Techn technology can play a part. For instance, we would love to get um, alternative uh, means of um, powering our uh, grow houses. I'd love to have solar panels. And I'd love to get more technology for the composting. But the actual growing needs to be done in soil. This is really, really important. Other methods are just not cutting the mustard. It's just not the way to go for a variety of reasons. But um, so having good seeds, the research has to go into the seed production. What seeds work well in the UAE desert? Develop those. Work with your own, create your own seed bank. That's what we're doing. It's one of our primary tasks is to have our own seed bank with seeds that were grown on this farm, produced on this farm, and that give really good uh, volume, really good yield without using any chemicals. That's the key to making it affordable and making it making honest food affordable in this climate, in this setting. That's the way to go. And you will see we haven't really increased prices in years and we even reduce some prices and over the next two years we will be able to reduce some prices substantially because we have now all our own seeds and we are doing so much better yield wise and that will reflect and that will benefit everyone will benefit from this yeah. including our planet because we're not poisoning it you know? yeah well one thing i think that maybe sometimes confusing or people aren't fully aware of is that even on organic these huge organic monoculture farms that are mm -hmm. very prevalent in the u.s for example they still use chemicals mm -hmm. on the on the produce. They're less toxic than the conventional mm -hmm. ones. But here you're really using very, like, n nothing. No, we're 100% chemical free. Yeah. We use no chemical fertilizer, no chemical um, pesticides, nothing. And we don't even buy the um, 
organic solutions that are available on the market. There is loads of organic pesticides and organic fertilizers ready made, and we make everything here. Yeah, we we have we do our own humic acid. We make our own potions. We ferment. It's actually great fun, to be honest. Yeah. I really like this bit. But we experiment and we, we, we draw a lot from Ayurvedic practices. And there's a lot of, there's a wealth. Nature provides us with everything we need, actually, to be yeah. honest. You know, there is so, like cinnamon, for instance. It's, it's a magic, magic um, ingredient for all of our potions. It's so good. But it has to be the real cinnamon, you know, the good quality cinnamon. And... Um, it could give you loads and loads of examples, you know, but it's really satisfying to make your own remedies, to make your own salt, create your own seeds, to look after, feed your own animals, you know, so that you your own little bubble. You yeah. Know? So for anyone that's, you know, at the grocery store, do you have any tips or advice for them? What to look for? How do they know if their organic is really organic or if it, how do they know that they're making the best choice? So every produce, should have a label attached to the basket, you know. So I, I don't believe in packaging things, but it should, the basket should have some sort of label attached to it, where it comes from and by whom it is grown. So even for local produce, if you see it in a basket, you can look at, oh, this is the name of the farm, then go up, Google it, look at their website, what is it that they do? Are they com producing their own compost? Are they producing their own seeds? What is their philosophy? You know, I think get in touch. If this is a brand that you buy regularly from, that you see all the time in your local supermarket, get, make an effort to get to know who they are. And then they should want to want to share information with you because growing organic food in the desert is a, a huge achievement and everyone should be willing to share their practices with you because customers are entitled for transparency. Yeah, so you, we, this is our duty to share with them what we do. You know, it's very important. So that's what I would do. I would, I would really, if I, if I see even imported items, you see it's coming from one place. This is one name that keeps cropping up. Look them up and see who they are, you know. And if you don't see a sign, then you go into the section in the supermarket and ask the staff and says, excuse me, these are local organic cucumbers or tomatoes or whatever. Who is the supplier? And they'll have to give you information. They will need to they know where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's safe to say here in Dubai, you have the best farm, the best produce. You're really growing it as nature intended. But for anyone in the U.S., I would say uh, look up for your local farmer's market and you yeah, can actually go and speak to your farmers. In the U.S. would be a great, yeah. a, a great way to purchase. But again, speak to the farmers. And see how they grow it. Because not speak everyone at them. the farmer's yeah. market is going to grow it the same way. Exactly. There will be huge differences between different farmers and and. Um, um, make up your own mind. Always ask yeah. questions. Yeah. You know, that's what I would say. Yeah. So you're very passionate about organic. You're very passionate about sustainability. What do you want people to know about organic sustainability or healthy eating? What, what, what is your message? And just what do you wish people knew? Well, you see, food is the answer to many of our problems. Food is the answer to our health issues. And food is the answer to our global issues, right? So, for instance, I really believe that um, the way we eat has created a lot of, for us personally, has created a lot of problems. Um, a lot of the chronic disease, we can trace it back to the way we eat. I'll give you an example, autism in children. 50 years ago, there was no autism. Now we have one in 100 children or even more now uh, that, that suffer from autism. This, we can trace that directly back to pesticides, right? Attention deficit disorder can be directly traced back to, to, to pesticides. There's a lot of research on this out there now. So, um, again, 50 years ago, that wasn't around. Now, I mean, there's like 4 million kids that have attention deficit in the US alone, I think. This is the latest figure that I, I read. So, just because we can't see the toxins that are on fresh food doesn't mean they're not there. So this is the misconception, you know, packaged food, you can see on the label what's in it, right? But fresh produce, you can't see what's on it and be eating a lot of toxins that we don't know what they're doing to us. And also, you mustn't forget, it's not just that there's one type of pesticide and one type of fungicide. There will be several different ones. And there's actually no research 
on what they do together. The reaction that they produce, the chemical compounds that are reacting with each other. There is zero, zero research out there. So we're basically, it's almost like we're living in an experiment because we don't know where it's going. We don't know what we're doing to ourselves. And the companies that are producing these chemicals, they don't know either <laughs> because they haven't done the research. So there, there's very little funding for this. So we're in a huge, and so we're making ourselves ill by eating the, the wrong food, but we're also killing our planet by growing the wrong food. We, we say nowadays there's the opinion that we can't feed the world without genetically modified foods, without chemicals, conventional farming has a, is a necessary evil. It's not true. It's propaganda. Right. Because we can, we look what we are able to do in the UAE desert. Yeah, it's We get incredible. more productive every year. We are better results every year, you know, and um, we don't have a huge, we don't have huge resources. We are our team of 12 here, you know, so we, we do a lot of things in a very step-by-step -step manner and we are able to achieve it. So I do not believe that we cannot do this larger scale in many different places, but it's nobody will grow terribly rich from it. You know, you will, you will make money, you are sustainable, you know, families can feed themselves from, from the money that they make from growing honest vegetables, but it's not going to make one company hugely rich. And this is what unfortunately what people are striving for and destroying our planet with the way we grow food is, is just the wrong approach because we, poison our water, we poison our soil, we kill our soil, we kill all the biodiversity, we kill the bees, we kill all the beneficial insects. And um, for what? Because sooner or later it's all dead and then you can't use that land anymore. It's gone, you see? So what farming should do, food production should create healthy soil and then this soil is able to store the excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Earlier on the ride over here, you were talking about how organic farming can be extremely beneficial for removing CO2 and helping with the whole climate change, helping to prevent that. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is really, really important and very few people know about this. So to grow genuine organic food, you need to produce organic soil. So we don't have soil here. So for us, it's always been a priority. So. The composting, we add nutrition to the soil, we add structure to the soil through composting and the roots and the soil they exchange. So it's not just that the roots take, which is our misconception, there is an exchange happening because soil is alive. There's so many microorganisms and a handful of healthy soil, there's more microorganisms than there's uh, humans on this planet. So soil is a living, breathing thing. And so the, the exchange between the soil and the roots produces a fungi. And this fungi has the ability to store carbon dioxide in the soil where it belongs. So if we were to change the way we produce food, we change our farming practices, we actually produce healthy soil, crop rotate, companion plant, do the right thing, allow for resting periods, grow from proper heirloom seeds, we can drastically reduce global warming through food production. And the Rodale Institute in the US has done a lot of research on this. And they are really my heroes, to be honest. And they have calculated that if we would change the way we farm tomorrow, you know, all of us, we could reduce global warming by a third in five years, five to six years. That's what they were estimating because of the way we would enrich the soil and the, 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 the fungi in the soil that would be able to capture and wow. uh, sequest carbon CO2. dioxide. Yeah. Wow. Switching gears just a little bit, for anyone who's trying to grow some organic produce at home or have a little herb garden, any tips for keeping them alive? Choose a shaded place. You know, you want to have morning sun, but you want to be shaded during lunchtime sun. Use a salt barrier, right? So even if you have nice looking, a nice looking patch, don't be fooled. There is salt 
rising up from below. So if you don't want to grow in containers, if you want to grow in the soil, you need to put in a salt barrier. This is not really difficult. You just dig a hole, you put in some agricultural cloth in, add some gravel, and then you put your soil on top. So a lot of people do use the bokashi composting system. They put the sweet sand in the mixture with the bokashi and then they grow in that. But the salt barrier is really, really important. Okay. And is that specific to this area or Yeah, everywhere? when you have a salty soil. So okay. we are close to the sea. So most okay. people that would grow close to the sea, they would have salty soil. Okay. Yeah. I tried growing herbs. I posted this beautiful photo on Instagram of all my herbs and flowers and they're all dead now. Yeah. Um, they lasted for a little while. Did you buy them in containers? Yeah. They were, I bought them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like in little things, but then I planted that. Well, I had the store plant them in a little container and they lasted a good couple of months, but now they're just shot. If you, yeah. I felt like if I didn't water them by the minute, you know, a yeah. minute too late, they were dead. What we recommend is for, for customers as well, if they buy our heirloom produce, like the, the fruit vegetables mostly, you know, they can keep the seeds. So put them on your windowsill, let mm -hmm. it rot, basically, keep the seeds inside for as long as possible. Yeah. And then you can take the seeds and grow from them. Yeah. So a lot of people do that. I know it's so interesting learning from you earlier about how to wait for the fruit and the seeds to actually rot before you you plant them again and that's how you get the best mm -hmm. seed and that's how it's done in nature yeah yeah so we copy nature this is our biggest teacher you know this is what we love we, we copy what nature does and then we we use the elements and be translated into farming yeah so one last question that i like mm -hmm. to ask everyone that comes on the show if there's just one tip or piece of advice to leave our listeners and our viewers on how to live a happier and healthier life, what would you tell them? Oh, a sense, a good sense of humor. If you don't have it already, develop a good sense of humor because every day, every minute, something new happens, for instance, to me in, in, on the farm or whatever. And you, you just have to, to be able to see the funny side and laugh about it and, 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 and just be kind to each other, you know, and um, put the love out there. Yes. And the love, it's very evident, the love that you have for organics, your farm, your customers. And I really thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out here. It was a pleasure to show you the farm. And the website is greenheartuae.com. Greenheartuae.com, yeah. And Instagram as well. So definitely, if you're in Dubai, check it out. I buy my produce from Elena every single week. And I forced her to let me come out here and see the farm and interview her because I really love her produce and everything that she's doing.